Kuba, and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. This is Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki. Today we'll be speaking with Shari Benor McNamara, the President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii. I don't want to take up the whole show reading off her bio, but she has an extensive background. She is from the Big Island and has studied political science, uh, has a law and MBA degree from UH, among other things. Speaking of political science, I have an interesting story, like I mentioned to Sherry. Um, while at Kapa High School, I think it was a junior year, we had a it was the only AP class they offered me, so I took political science. We had to do a project, and my project was to repeal the motorcycle helmet law. <laughs> and, and a few years later, they repealed it, and it stands still today. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, Sherry has worked for the um, state, Hawaii State Legislature, the Hawaii Bowl, Sony Carp, Elton Ja, Senator Kaka, and in the White House, she has lived in Tokyo, New York, DC, and London. She serves on many nonprofit boards and been recognized by the Pacific Business Journal, uh, Hawaii Business Magazine, among other organizations. Shari, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. Good to see yeah. you. <laughs> Let's talk about your life first. We're only 30 minutes, <laughs> but uh, let's start from your childhood and to where we are now. Jerry? Sure. Uh, so I was born in actually Tokyo, Japan, because my mom uh, was born and raised in Japan, and she moved to Hawaii over 50 years ago, I believe. Uh, so yeah, she had she went back to have me and then came right back. So my entire life, that was pretty much raised in Hilo uh, and I went to Hilo Union, Waikia Intermediate, Waikia High School, so proud uh, public school graduate. And my dad's side, my grandpa and grandma immigrated from the Philippines and my grandpa, uh, Angelo, was a laborer. Uh, and after he was let go, uh, he just focused on his farm in Pahoa. And his farm had everything. I mean, from oranges, tangerines, uh, avocado, mountain apple, ulu, papaya, macadamia nuts. And I remember my brother and I, my brother John John and I used to spend every summer in Pahoa with my grandparents because my parents worked. And they would put us to work. So, you know, we would pick all the fruits and vegetables and also uh, even crack macadamia nuts. So there, there were times I cracked my thumb here and there. It was the kind of old fashioned way of cracking a macadamia <laughs> nuts. And um, yeah, but that was the way they fed their family. Uh, that was the, the way they, they made a living. That's the way they uh, uh, supported their neighbors by giving them free vegetables and fruits. So it's very community focused and all their kids, uh, six of them, all served in the public sector, uh, from secretary to uh, a director to my dad, who was a manage, deputy managing director under Mayor Matayoshi. Uh, so my grandparents really ingrained the work ethic and the need to always support the greater good, the greater community. Uh, so that's sort of my family background. Um, I have sister a lot of half sisters and brothers and a wonderful brother john john um but yeah and then so once i was done with high school um uh, i went to school in la ucla uh and spent eight years on the continent and then two years in japan working for sony and then made my thought, okay, it's time to come back home. So I moved back home to Hawaii and I didn't come back home with any job. So I decided, oh, it's time to go back to school. And so I went to, um, uh, I applied to law school and uh, got in. And it was after the first year, I recognized that I didn't want to practice law, but I decided, you know what? I did my first year just stick it through. So I ended up doing that. And then I said, you know what, I'm just going to add one more year and go to get my MBA. Um, so I did that. And, but in between from getting my 
uh, going to law school in the morning and then going to business school in the evening, I held two jobs. Uh, one of them was at Sheraton Hawaii Bowl and the other one was at the state capitol. Uh, I was a legislative aide and it was during that time I really found the passion. I mean, I had a lot of exciting jobs through uh, my career in different kind of industries, but it, it was this one that really um, tug up my heart and felt that that was what I wanted to do. Uh, so after I graduated, um, didn't quite want to work at the state capitol, but wanted to work in government affairs. Uh, and so I sent my resumes to every law firm that had a government affairs division. And there was one, um, most of them did not respond, but there was one that did, but said, I mean, we don't have a position, but we do want to meet with you. So I said, okay, so we had coffee, talk story. And then lo and behold, a few days later, she said, oh, there was a job at the Chamber of Commerce opening up in government affairs. I said, oh, okay. I had no idea what the chamber was. And so I looked it up and realized it was a business organization with most of their membership, small businesses. So the mission was to advocate for business, uh, but that's what resonated because my mom owns a small business in Hilo uh, for more than 40 years. And I've seen what she had to go through, the sacrifices, the blood, sweat, tears to keep her doors open. So it just kind of aligned. And that's where I thought, okay, I can do this. And 16 years later, I'm still at the Chamber of Commerce Hawaii. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's great. Um, I heard uh, there's a funny story about how your mom met your dad and how oh. you met your husband. You want to tell us yeah. about it? <laughs> wow, you really did your research. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my mom and dad. So after my mom's first marriage ended, uh, you know, she was living in Honolulu, but she had moved to uh, Honolulu and then um, from Japan. And then my dad at that time was campaigning because he ran for the House of Representatives in uh, for the Makiki district. And so he's just knocking on doors. And one of the doors he knocked was my mom's door, apartment door. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> and then my husband, John McNamara. Uh, so he had just moved to uh, Oahu from uh, Chicago at that time uh, because he was recruited uh, by the University of Hawaii Athletics director at that time. And so that was in 2004. Uh, and at that time I was working at the Sheraton Hawaii Bowl. And so we had an event at Murphy's Bar and Grill and he comes walking in and I'm like, okay, he missed a speaking engagement. So I was not too happy because I was responsible for that. And I say, he's missed your speaking engagement. And he said, oh, okay. And he starts walking in, start mingling with others. And then he got, um, he forgot his name tag. So I went up to him, you forgot your name tag. So he goes, oh, and then he was telling us. So anyway, we were all sitting around the table. He sat next to me just talking story and we just could not stop talking. So one by one, as people started to go, uh, they said, oh, sure, you want to ride home? I said, he said, no, no, I'll take her home. I'll take her, I'll give her a ride home. And then 15 people later, <laughs> finally at the end, it was just the two of us. Uh, and so he went to the restroom and he came back and said, there's something I need to tell you. And I said, oh gosh, don't tell me what he I don't know, you know, I was thinking the worst at that moment because I really liked this guy. And then finally he goes, I don't have a car. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, geez. He's like, he, I didn't live in North Shore someplace far because that taxi ride would have been really expensive. <laughs> but, and what, that was 2004. We got married in 2007. So 17 years later. Yeah. So you're pretty gullible then. <laughs> and, uh, and, anyway, we'll, uh, yeah, <laughs> or trusting, yeah. Um, yeah, most noted uh, for your leadership at the uh, way Chamber of Commerce. Um, can you tell us uh, about some of your work, uh, especially during the pandemic? Yeah, Dennis, thank you so much for asking. You know, the past couple of years obviously have been um, just some of the darkest moments for many, from families to individuals um, and to our local and small businesses. So for our chamber, uh, we had to put a halt on our regular activities because a lot of it was event-based. So 
obviously we could not pursue and move on with live events. So what we did was just pivot and did everything we did could possible to help our small um, and local businesses navigate during this time because no one had a playbook. Yeah. Um, and initially it, we felt that there was nothing being done, you know, no matter. And so we felt that we had to advocate even louder. Uh, and so we did. And then finally said, okay, there's a lot of CARES monies out there and it's not being spent. What can we do to help businesses? So we came up with two programs, one, the Hawaii restaurant card program and to the Hawaii Business Pivot Program. And we proposed those two programs to Governor Ige, and fortunately he supported both of them. So as you may be familiar with the Hawaii Restaurant Card Program, that was a $75 million program that actually pumped in more than $150 million into the economy, stabilized the restaurant industry, because they were being impacted severely uh, and saved many jobs, uh, restaurants and the entire supply chain from the distributors to repair shops to the fishermen, farmers, right? Because the supply chain of the restaurant industry goes so long. So we're, uh, you know, really humbled by the support of that program that gave the cards to those on, on um, unemployment, uh, $500 gift uh, cards. So they were able to, at that moment, spend it maybe at their favorite restaurant that they couldn't go to at that time. Uh, so we thought it was a, a, a program that benefited all during that time. And the Hawaii Business Pivot Program, as you know, many of them had to pivot uh, and find different ways to operate and run their business. So we ran that program as well. And that was a $25 million uh, program. So those are some of the highlights. And we also stood up hawaiishiring.com, which is a one-stop job center where those who were seeking employment could find jobs uh, from, and search by different industries, different type of position, different from a, uh, different islands. Uh, and we continue to add to that website. So those who want to retrain from hospitality industry to, let's say, uh, technology, we have resources to help them retrain them. Uh, and we partner with the University of Hawaii, the community colleges, workforce development, and really did what we could to partner with as many organizations and government as possible so that collectively we could get back on track with economic recovery, get people back to work uh, amongst other uh, initiatives. So, yeah, it was a tough couple of years, but through it all, you know, many of us pushed forward and it, we're still not out of the woodwork as we see. Omicron has again disrupted many of business operations um, as well as employees by you know catching the Omicron because it's so contagious. Uh, but yeah, we're you know, but we're gonna continue to push forward and work together as with as many people as we can to ensure that our local mom and pop stores, small businesses can survive uh, and thrive, hopefully. Do, um, as we move forward. Yeah, thanks. Um, what about the tourism and the Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association? With, uh, and they're, you know, where are they going right now? And they come. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, I think many of us are on the same page in terms of we need to manage tourism better, and that is happening right now. Uh, HTA came up with the destination management plans. And what's great about that is that there's one for each island because each island is different and it also engaged different stakeholders. So not only those in the industry, but those or those connected to the industry, but those outside of the industry to really get constructive feedback as to what can be done to manage tourism better. Uh, what can we do to ensure that visitors can have a positive experience and what can we do to make tourism more sustainable so those action plans uh, were finalized some of them uh, it's ongoing real time so there uh, each island has its own and checking off what you know has been done and what needs to be done um, because ultimately tourism industry is still a number one industry and we need to support it because it can't just go away overnight but Next is how can we interconnect 
uh, other industries in Hawaii, uh, whether it's ag, you know, having more ag products used by the tourism industry, um, manufacturing companies here. How can we promote our manufacturing products, made in Hawaii products, to visitors more effectively? Um, technology. How can we incorporate more technology industries? So, you know, it's very inter. How can we make it more interconnected so that tourism benefits other industries as well? Um, because again, tourism industry is our number one industry largest job provider um, by a, a single industry. So we need to support it, but we also need to manage it and do better. Uh, recently, uh, Governor Ige mentioned the $100 giveaway. Um, you see it as similar to your restaurant card? Yeah, you know, anything to um, support um, the working families, support, you know, all of us here, um, our people, um, because it's tough times still for many of them. And, you know, the cost of living is so high, affordable housing, I mean, housing is so high uh, amongst other challenges. So every dollar counts. And if that hundred dollars can go to um, those who need it the most, um, that way they can use it to the basic necessities because again, many are still struggling to get out of the situation. Um, similarly to a car program, it was to help those who are unemployed and also help an industry uh, and have it a multiplier effect and to have, you know, have a greater return on, um, on the initial investment of the hundred dollar. Yeah, but, um... I heard it's going to be tied into like a taxpayer, a tax credit. Does it mean it's going to be only for taxpayers and not necessarily some other people that may need it? Yeah, we'll see, right? Because the legislative session just started. We need to look at the bills. Yeah. And as it goes through the process, it will evolve. Uh, but the underlying um, Point is that we need to address all pillars of the cost of living. Um, wage is one factor. Um, you know, they're talking about minimum wage. Housing is another, uh, as well as child care. And so what can we do holistically and, and approach it in a more holistic way so that we can address all these different pillars that increase the cost of living uh, and manage that? So, you know, while the $100 is going to help, we also need to look at the other um, other pillars that are driving the cost of living. Okay, since you mentioned it, uh, the minimum wage is a big, big thing. Yes. You speak for the members of the Chamber of Commerce uh, with regards to, in the past, fighting the minimum wage increase. Uh, however, many people have to work like two or three jobs to make ends meet. So what do you say to that? Yeah, you know, in the past, we have supported minimum wage increases. Um, 2019, um, we uh, did not because we heard from our members that it was a little challenging. And then 2020, we did support a minimum wage. And then the legislature uh, canceled session because that's when COVID started. Uh, last session, 2021, uh, we did not support an increase because, as you know, many of our local businesses were still uh, climbing out of that deep hole that COVID uh, uh, caused because we were nearly in a shutdown uh, twice. Uh, so many of them depleted their savings. Many of them took out loans. Many of them lost revenue due to um, lost business. And so we felt that the timing wasn't right. And now for this session, we do support some type of increase. Uh, we recently surveyed our members uh, to see what their thoughts are on the $18 uh, stepped up increase. Uh, and you know, with Omicron and the workforce shortage amongst and the supply chain issues, uh, there are some concerns that were expressed by, uh, by members um, because they felt that that might be a, a little bit too steep and considering that it, um, it, there's still not a full recovery. Uh, but we understand that we do, inflation is a huge issue and wages do need to go up. Uh, so we are going to support some type of increase uh, and still assessing what that level is. Uh, and one thing to know, because here in Hawaii, we're the only state in the nation that provides prepaid health care. And it's, it's, it's a huge benefit, an important benefit. Mm -hmm. And 
employers support that. Uh, but when you factor in what that costs per employee, that's another three to four dollars per employee um, per hour. So in all the different fringe benefits that's tied into the wage level is factored in. So it's the wage level amount plus another three to four or even six if you factor in the fringe benefit. So just, you know, as we discuss minimum wage, I uh, want to make sure that that's an, um, that the lawmakers understand that as they discuss what level they want to increase it to. Um, but we also hope that if they do increase, there'll be some type of um, support for our local businesses, whether it's uh, tax credit or something that will help offset the increase. Um, but again, in general, we do, we are, we want to support and increase this session because we recognize uh, the cost of living is extraordinarily high and prices continue to go up. And many of our families are so struggling during this time. Yes, uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, it's not only the direct uh, salary, you know, you got the, the benefits. Uh, some people get like over two months of paid leave, you know, benefits, vacation, sick leave, holidays, and, you know, this all come back, come out of the, uh, the employer. Mm -hmm. So you can only look at the base pay. Uh, if, uh, go ahead. And then many, you know, talking with small businesses as well as serving, you know, they want to do everything they can, right, to keep their employees, to provide the benefits, because many of our small businesses here in Hawaii are less than 25 employees, less than 10. So it, they're like family, and many of them are flexible uh, in providing, whether it's sick leave or family leave or uh, vacation, whatever it is. And um, now more than ever, businesses need to work with employees and be flexible. Um, you know, let's talk about um, the workforce shortage. You know, that's been a huge challenge uh, for many businesses across the board. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, but finding workers. Um, and the, one way to attract workers is, and or to keep workers is to provide those benefits and to be flexible with their schedules. Uh, so that's what we encourage as well, um, you know, in terms of our businesses to provide those type of opportunities as well. And then, of course, where they can, and we're seeing this already, uh, many of them are increasing their wage levels as a way to attract employees, keep employees, um, but recognizing also the cost of living issue. Yeah, that's, that's a biggie. Um, I know you, you spent you know, a lot of time uh, at the chamber, but besides your work at the chamber, what do you say uh, is your most memorable, memorable uh, accomplishment? Wow, I've been 16 years at the chamber so far. <laughs> uh, there is uh, so many to name, uh, yeah. you know, and we, because and because we have a wonderful and a team that believes in the mission of the organization and work hard. But I couldn't be more proud in the past couple of years how they've stepped up uh, during this time to help save our small businesses, to help them navigate. COVID pandemic in the past couple of years, uh, as well as finding new and innovative ways to help our business community during this time. Uh, and this team we have now is just, it's just uh, I, I can't say enough about them and the positive energy they bring uh, and the desire to ensure that we do good and help our businesses. So, you know, there's a lot of projects we've done in the last 16 years that have helped businesses uh, as well as, oh, but I like to add, one thing is our strengthening our education workforce development. So we've been investing more in that, working with high schools, working with community colleges and uh, other other type of programs and really strengthening our talent pipeline, uh, creating different types of jobs uh, and getting our kids excited about those type of jobs. Uh, so that, that's been very exciting to see how we've been so uh, involved in education, uh, in connecting our students with work-based learning opportunities and providing them exposure to what's out there uh, so that 
they will want to stay home here, knowing that there are jobs out there. Uh, so that's an area. I could talk another hour about that that area, but it's it's truly um, it's truly exciting to see that kind of progress going on and making a real impact on student lives as well as our talent pipeline. Okay, we have like a few minutes left. I uh, should have asked this earlier. Okay, you uh, you know a couple of years ago you were has hesitated to answer a question if you're running for political office and now you're running for lieutenant governor okay um here's a question from a listener uh what do you think you can do more as a lieutenant governor than as president of the chamber of commerce of hawaii well you know i for me uh you know i, I asked i get asked the three whys why am i running why lg and why me? You know, for me, my constituency right now is the business community. And I just felt that as we get back on track towards economic recovery, I wanted to serve the, a broader constituency. And what I saw in the past couple of years uh, and the uh, and the, the lack of communication, the lack of um, connection to our communities, uh, and the it just propelled me to take that leap uh, and wanting to make an impact on a broader level. Uh, so that's, that's why I decided to make a run for Lieutenant Governor. But why Lieutenant Governor? Because based on my role as President CEO of the Chamber of Commerce uh, and all my different uh, jobs I had throughout my career, it was about collaboration. It was about bringing people together, uh, working with different stakeholders and connecting with different stakeholders out there. So I felt that that was where the LG could serve a role in partnering with the governor from day one and being sort of that bridge builder between our communities and government. Uh, uh, working with the legislature, working with the governor, and finding collaborative solutions by listening to the communities out there across the islands. Uh, and that's where I see the LG can play a purposeful role uh, in doing that, in, in truly going out into the communities, listening, and then being that bridge builder and being that link uh, and helping the governor shape uh, uh, policy agenda that will get us back on track towards economic recovery, expand job opportunities, uh, really, and restore trust in government. And I'm not a career politician. As you know, this is my first time running on a campaign from ground up. Uh, but it was, it was a decision I felt that was important and that I wanted to do to make a broader impact for our state. Yeah, and I am from uh, Hilo, so I, I yeah. also believe that the neighbor island voice is not as represented. And so coming from the neighbor island, specifically Hilo, I understand that firsthand. Uh, so I want to make sure that all islands are heard uh, and their, their voice is part of the process. Yeah, thanks. Um, Lieutenant Governor's uh, jobs and what the governor gives them, right? Surely they won't let you do two jobs like Josh Green. <laughs> anyway, anyway, also you're you're born in the you're born in Japan, right? Correct. Okay, so uh, you know that you cannot run for the president of the United States, right? <laughs> yes, I'm a naturalized citizen. You're exactly right. <laughs> okay, we got uh, a lot of women running. You know, that women running. Great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're running for lieutenant governor and for for uh, governor. You know, we got uh, we've been running, so that's good. So, and some some people say like, oh, that you know, how can you have two women or something? What do you say to that? We need more women in uh, in in uh, leadership positions yeah. in government. Uh, ultimately, we want to make sure that. Uh, um, whoever is governor, he or she uh, is focused on the, the key and critical issues and that, uh, you know, lieutenant governor will partner with the governor. We can't have a competing agendas or a competition from day one, then it just won't work and it's not fair to the people. Uh, and so we need to ensure that whoever gets elected for lieutenant governor or and governor, that they work together hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder as partners. Okay, um, 
you got uh, we're out of time you got any closing uh statements yeah well dennis thank you so much for the opportunity you know it's it's been a tough couple of years for for all of us uh and we're gonna push through and we we need to bring that hope and optimism back and the upcoming election will be critical uh to determine okay do we want same old, same old, or do we want fresh ideas, fresh leadership, fresh perspectives? Whatever the decision is, that's something that the voter will need to decide on. Um, but, you know, it, whatever they decide on, making sure that they do vote, get their voices heard, and also get engaged in, in the process, um, because the more people who advocate or get active, the better we can to come up with collaborative and collective solutions. So I just thank you uh, and just wanted to thank also all, everyone out there and from the chamber at all the local business, our mom and pop shops for really pushing forward for their determination, resilience and their grit because uh, they, they've been working hard uh, to ensure that they can keep their doors open. And it, it's, it's just amazing and inspiring when we do talk with them and they share their story. Okay. Thank you. Um, I understand you'll be coming to Kauai, so I'll see you yes. with, with Marco Yama at yes. Thirsty, Thirsty Thursday <laughs> and, and also at the uh, Filipino Chamber. Yes, yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing uh, you uh, as well uh, as all okay. the folks. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we're out of time. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed listening to Sherry Menor McNamara on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you to the viewers for joining me on Politics in Hawaii. Please help support Think Tech Hawaii by donating online to thinktechhawaii.com so we can continue sharing these shows with you. Aloha, mahalo, ahoy ho, malama pono. <laughs>